This week on Outdoor Bound TV, we travel to the hills of eastern Wyoming in early October with a Wisconsin couple who are hoping to hunt for antelope with a bow. Now most hunters who attempt an antelope hunt with archery equipment opt to hunker in a blind over a water hole. But not this duo. They, along with their guide Ray, decide to pursue an antelope buck spot and stalk style, despite one incredible obstacle. Take a look at this muskie. Here we go. Got him. We have found the bluefish. I have two bass on. Such a thick fish. That was awesome. I love it. Outdoor Bound TV is brought to you by Mission by Matthews and Vortex Optics. Hi everyone, welcome to Outdoor Bound TV. I'm Kurt Walbeck. On this week's show, we travel to the state of Wyoming for an early October antelope hunt with a Wisconsin couple who, well, let's just say they met by accident. I'm Jerry Chinock from Toma, Wisconsin. I've lived in Toma my entire life. I work um, currently for Martin Transport as a dispatcher and own my own seamless gutter business. I'm Jennifer Chinock. I grew up in Minneapolis. I ended up moving to Toma where I became a personal trainer and director of Anytime Fitness in town. One of the things I like to do is hunt. Um, I, I do a lot of hunting around the Toma area, and then I've also hunted other states of Minnesota, South Dakota. Get up in the morning, we drove around looking, glassing for antelope, and uh, finally we found some in this um, alfalfa field that looked like a couple nice ones. So I, being my stubborn self, I decided I wanted to stock up on them and try and shoot it with my bow. And when Jared wants to hunt anything, whether it's in Wyoming or Wisconsin, it takes a lot more effort because we have to get them out there. <laughs> and you can't just walk out there, you have to push the wheelchair. So I don't mind doing it um, at all. If he wants to get it done, I'll help him get it done. But it's definitely not easy to do it. When we pulled up to the field and we were gonna decide to spot and stock a little bit, um, I was trying to figure out how we were gonna do it because those, the speed goats are pretty skittish <laughs> and it seemed like as soon as we'd pull up in the in the buggy they'd take off so um, I guess what I saw was a field full of potential beautiful animals and an impossible feat but he wanted to try it and it was I'm glad he's willing to try those things you know if it's challenging that's no reason to not try it Jared was holding his bow and I was attempting to push him in the chair through the big divots of the field. Yeah, so when we first started, in the back of my mind the whole time, I'm thinking like, this isn't gonna work. You know? <laughs> I'm like, but well, we gotta at least try. Part of that was because the drive of wanting to make it happen because Ron was like, just shoot him out of the back of the truck, <laughs> you know, and I didn't want to do that. But then getting out there and the further we got out into the hayfield and using the 
the pivot as uh, to kind of break up our silhouette and everything like that. Um, and noticing like the antelope that were bedded down weren't actually getting up and they were still feeding, going on with what they were doing and even though we were getting closer um, and it was, so more and more, I got more and more confident that like, hey, this, this actually might work, you know? So it, it kept me moving forward thinking, you know, the longer they laid there, it was like, all right, this is just working. Like, let's keep going. <laughs> so it was a big help. When we got about well over halfway and I finally got my rangefinder up and ranged them and we were like 195 yards from them and after I seen that number pop up in my rangefinder I'm like what well, like this is this is working Even though we're using this like little decoy and I got my big wheelchair out here I'm, I didn't think it was you know we'd be able to get that close to them and we're using the wheels on the pivot like all right we got to this set let's hang we'd hang out there for a little bit kind of watch them let them calm back down if they seemed like they were getting um, a little nervous or something and then we'd kind of look at each other and be like oh we made it to this set of wheels let's try and make it to the next one so that's what we did and, we didn't make it quite to the center of the pivot. We didn't get in bow range. We got about 100 yards from them. And the one uh, bigger buck of them got up and started making his way off the field um, back up onto the hillside. And uh, every, all the other antelope decided that once he got up and started walking off, they were gonna follow him. And so we decided that um, we gave it all we had and we'd go back and have some lunch, and try it in the afternoon. We took it about 100 yards away, 125? 115. 115, yeah. Well, we made a good stock on them, but they decided to leave. <laughs> they, didn't, <laughs> they didn't like us. But, so we're going to go find a different one. Hopefully. Try again. The plan for the afternoon was to get out early before the herd entered the field. Set up camp in the middle of the pivot and try to kind of hunker down and camouflage ourselves in there so that we could be there before they move in. So we're sitting in the pivot and we could see the antelope um, and some mule deer bedded on the hillside and you know it goes through your mind it's like are they ever gonna come back out here you know um, stuff so but then finally it, all it takes is a couple out there to get up and get hungry to come out and it, they just start pouring out single file and 
we're kind of more focused on the antelope and all of a sudden these mule deer does just start coming from like our side a different direction and next thing you know they're like 30 yards from us 40 yards from us and they start being mule deer doe you know doing the foot stomp and the head bob <laughs> and they decide they don't like us being there and they kind of trot further off into the field and that alerted the antelope so then they kind of just basically put up a barrier too like all right we won't get any closer either It was disappointing to be underneath the full moon out in the middle of Wyoming. It was the perfect setting. We thought we had hatched out the perfect plan, got out there early. Everything seemed like it was working good and um, they just, they were a little sketched out, I guess. We seen some nice antelope bucks out here earlier this afternoon, so we decided we'd come sit in this pivot with the bow and see if we could get one to come in the bow range and they knew we were here I think and they kept about a 200, dis 200 yard distance from us so we'll try again in the morning. Outdoor Bound TV is brought to you by Mission Crossbows and HHA Sports. Before my accident, my biggest passion was snowmobiling. February 24th was the day of the accident. We were going down the trail and I was leading. Stood up on my snowmobile, turned around because I knew my dad liked to cut off the trail and kind of take a shortcut back to his house. So I'm going to turn around and follow him. So I turned around. Well, now we're going through like three foot, four foot of powder, and I caught back up to another one of but another one of my buddies. And the last thing I remember was looking over at him, and then everything was black. And I remember laying in the snow, couldn't catch my breath. So I ripped my helmet off, and then like couldn't sit up when I tried to sit up. And once the paramedics got there, and after yelling at him for cutting my snowmobile gear off. <laughs> kind of started to black out from there. And they med flow me to Duluth Hospital, so I um, spent my entire hospital time in Duluth. Waking up in the hospital, and I had thousands of computers and wires and hoses sticking out of me. Kind of just with blur, some family members coming in and out of the room. And I was in ICU for uh, three weeks and then got transferred over to inpatient therapy. I don't really remember anybody saying anything to me, you know, in the hospital, you know, that, hey, you're going to be, might be in a wheelchair the rest of your life. Um, and part of it, I think, laying on the ice, like it clicked to me and, uh, that that happened. Um, but as the days went on, you know, they started taking the tubes out, started taking machines off me, and I started feeling more and more of the pain and stuff. Uh, everything above the injury, um, and then having to get transferred on all the medicines because it's off the IV, stuff like that. It was, so that part was tough. And then I finally come home on, in end of April, something like that. When he rolled into the gym, he looked, he looked like a shell of a man. He was just, he had just lost everything. And his sister knew that he needed to get out of the house and keep moving and have a hobby, have something to do. So he came regular as clockwork. For like the first um, couple days to a week, I think I would just roll around and act like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> until one day Jen came up to me and asked if I needed help. and. So she helped me a couple times, and then after that, we kind of just set a schedule to start. She'd start helping me work out every day. We were spending so much time together, and we enjoyed each other's company. It seemed like everything just kind of clicked together, fell in place. And we did a lot of learning together, and for 
a year we spent five days a week training in the gym and we found love and <laughs> got married and it's a good story. Yeah, so we got up the next day and um, it was the last full day that um, I could hunt and so we decided to put the bow down and grab the rifle and since I had the rifle that we would expand our region instead of hunting focusing on the alfalfa fields and we would go kind of more in the uh, back side of the ranch and cruise around and try and find uh, a bigger pronghorn. Just cruising around in the side by side looking for antelope and we come across the mule deer and we're all kind of in awe you know just like just a couple days prior like I shot what everybody thought was one of the bigger mule deer ever shot on the ranch and here are these three really nice mule deer laying on this hillside sunning themselves and we're watching them and all of a sudden out of nowhere here comes a couple antelope running over the hill running directly at us and it was uh, two does and one buck so we just sat there and watched them and another buck come up out of nowhere and they started fighting what looked like would be to the death and they dropped down in a little uh, ravine so that's when we decided like let's make it happen. Archery, um, it's been a big part of my life, you know. I, <clears throat> my grandpa was a big hunter, but he didn't so much agree with the archery stuff, but he supported my dad and I in archery hunting. Um, but then my dad got into archery and he introduced it to me and I took it to the extreme compared to my dad. You know, my dad's uh, just a straight up Wisconsin hunter where I'm gonna go out and shoot a deer field freezer where I'm gonna shoot the biggest thing that walks by me. That's what I'm waiting for, you know? When I got home from the hospital, um, as soon as it was warm enough, I started shooting bow. And I had to start with a little kid bow. And then by September, I'm pulling 60 pounds. Yeah, and then it got to the point when archery season came around, um, I would have someone drop me off in my ground blind before they went to work, before daylight and then sat there all day until someone got home to pick me up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, archery hunt played a big role for me in my recovery just because it gave me something to look forward to and it kind of proved me that like I could do it. Seeing a man come in who's lost everything and we spent a lot of time talking when we were stretching out and exercising and we had like two hours together every day, five days a week we covered a lot of topics and um, he kept saying, I'm never gonna be able to do this. I, I wish I could do that. And it kind of became a personal mission to show him that he could do some of these things that he doesn't think he can do. We went skydiving. He's been snorkeling in Hawaii. And then he's been rock climbing. He's been hunting in states he's never hunted in before. and. He's got his business back. I mean, everything that he thought he lost, he's got back. Since my accident and then meeting Jen and um, getting a bunch of things back that either I got rid of at the beginning of, since I got home from my accident or just, you know, thought I lost after the accident um, and gaining all that back, 
most of it is because of her drive pushing me to do that, you know. It's keeping him focused on the end goal, I guess, was the big thing was there's going to be bad days, but remember what you want out of life and shoot for that. And him showing up and being willing to try all that stuff was, was why it worked. Yeah, if you had asked Jared a couple years prior, he would have said he couldn't do that, that that's something he couldn't do anymore was go hunting out west. And um, it was a huge accomplishment to, and a proud moment to see him in his glory out there taking a couple animals that were dream animals for him. Outdoor Bound TV is brought to you by Acme Tackle and Mountain Dew. I'd just like to thank everybody at, from Outdoor Adventures, um, Ray especially, our guide, for putting up with us. <laughs> I'd like to thank my wife for coming with me and helping, my boss for letting me take off from work. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody would be thinking about applying for the hunt with Outdoor Adventures, um, I would definitely recommend it. They make it about the hunter and make sure you're comfortable and... It's just been an awesome experience. The, the guys at Outdoor Adventures, the um, volunteers are amazing. The lodge is completely accessible. They make you very comfortable. They take really good care of you, feed you good. <laughs> well, that's a pretty cool story. But fortunately for Jared, that's only one chapter. He was just recently included into a trial at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Let's check out that story. The spine surgeons have to put the bone back, put screws into his spine. By putting the bone back, doesn't put the spinal cord back. And that's why, despite that surgery, he was still paralyzed. Jared Chinock accepted that he would likely never have the use of his legs again. But in 2016, he became the first person enrolled in a Mayo Clinic research project, combining rigorous physical therapy with innovative high-tech neurosurgery. Before the surgery, however, the team would spend six months reacquainting Jared's muscles, joints, and nerves with the mechanics of walking. A special treadmill and harness system played a key role. A lot of his body weight is offloaded, and therapists and trainers and kinesiologists are kind of moving his limbs through a repetitive pattern using a very standardized rehab approach. But the physical therapy is necessary to uh, get the muscles stronger because remember because this patient has been paralyzed for three years there's been atrophy and so we do need to get the muscles firing again. While there are no promises there is hope. I always think about walking I mean who wouldn't I guess if you if you did before and there's chance that you could yeah of course you're gonna think about walking again <laughs> you know. To allow Jared's spinal cord to once again signal his legs to move voluntarily, Dr. Kendall Lee surgically implants a small computer-controlled stimulator. The device is already FDA approved for treating pain and was granted special approval for this clinical study. The electrode's many contacts are very carefully positioned inside the vertebrae, between the bone and the spinal cord, below his level of injury. Called epidural stimulation, mild electrical current is directed to the specific nerves needed to activate the muscles. It definitely feels like science fiction. Flex, 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 flex. Without the stimulator activated, Jared was still at the mercy of his injury, but once switched on, the response was immediate. The first day they turned it on, it was almost mind-blowing because it was like right away I was able to move my toes. Go, 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 go. Something I haven't seen in a while, you know. <laughs> We're really excited because our results uh, went beyond our expectations. Okay, we're at 5'8 right now. A remote wand allows the stimulator beneath the skin of Jared's abdomen to be fine-tuned. Adjustments to electrical signal strength and the areas of the spinal cord being activated bring even greater progress. This has really set the tone for our post-surgical rehabilitation, trying to use that function to drive even more return of function. We're now in the process of training this patient 
to see whether or not he can have what's called stepping motion. Can he step? Lift the leg, kick the foot out. Lift the leg, kick the foot out. That's pretty much what I'm saying to myself every step. We're collecting quantitative measures so that we can get some real evidence about what's changing, if anything, during the rehab. If what they learn could help others, Dr. Lee says the potential population that could benefit numbers in the millions, and not just by getting them on their feet again. We're now looking at, can we help these patients not only volitional movement, but other autonomic functions, such as bowel, bladder, and sexual function. Jared says because his core strength has improved, his balance seems better. He's amazed to see muscle mass returning to his legs, and he welcomes any improvements in function that reinforce his independence. I tried to adapt and figure out how I could do everything I did before, before the accident. And I just kind of took it as it was and like, I'm not gonna let it slow me down. If I am able to walk again, it's definitely gonna be a plus. The unknown is good because it's possible, it's always possible that that may happen. As far as Jared is concerned, that's a shot worth taking. Outdoor Bound TV is brought to you by Markham Technologies and Rapala. Hi, I'm Jared from Toma, Wisconsin, and oh. <laughs> I'm not saying it because you're putting it on the blooper reel. Outbound TV, outbound TV, right? <laughs> you were doing so good, too. I know, I was. You were on yeah. a roll. How do you want me to go into that? <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after these. Oh, you were so close. I know. I was going to say words <laughs> from these sponsors. And that's a wrap. <laughs>